I'm, I'm Andrew and I'm top of the list, so I'm going to start. So, OK, so most of you know me anyway, I hope. And if you don't, I'm one of the co-producers of Walk, Less and Create. I, I run something called the Museum of Walking. I podcast with TalkingWalking.net. And um, uh, I read Heavy Time, which is Sonia's uh, book that we're kind of celebrating. And uh, I might be chatting a lot about and uh, have a copy here. Yeah. Um, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. I've 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 not read any of Sonia's writing before, so I'm really looking forward to uh, talking about um, uh, writing and walking and what set her off on that journey and isolation and uh, togetherness. So I uh, hope that's enough for me. Uh, Pabak, you're actually the next one in the alphabetical list. It's getting a bit boring from just the walk, listen, create team, but you have a go too. Or maybe an easy introduction uh, to get everyone else on board to speak as well. Uh, but indeed, together with Andrew and a third person who is not here, Geert, uh, we are the team behind Walk, Listen, Create. Uh, Geert sadly is not here because, because he is down for the count with uh, the consequences of uh, his second COVID jab. Um, the, one of the things that uh, the three of us uh, facilitate uh, is uh, the upcoming Soundwalk September, um, which is basically a month-long celebration of Soundwalks. And this year, for the first time, um, we are uh, facilitating something that is led by two artists in Ljubljana, which is Soundwalk City. Uh, and the two artists are Zona uh, together, and they were uh, one of the uh, honorable mentions uh, for last year's Soundwalk September Award. Uh, so even though Prespes, which has just finished, was uh, uh, a whirlwind of activities. Uh, now in September, we can do another whirlwind lut uh, of activities. So I hope you're also like ourselves, very much looking forward to this. Um, okay, next on the list is Claire. Claire, would you like to? Um, well, I've been on a number of things with the um, Museum of Walking, uh, with Andrew, particularly their um, art. Um, uh, and I've enjoyed those, um, and um, I um, and um, I walk around here quite a lot, especially uh, during the last. Um, God, how how long is it? Um, well, I'm getting on for two, two years uh, uh, during the um, pandemic. Um, and uh, I've had to get used to walking on my own quite a lot. Um, so I'd be interested in what Sonia has to say about it. Great, thanks, Claire. Uh, Danny, is Danny there? Yes, yeah, so um, I wasn't really too sure like what to expect, um, but I saw Sonia's name crop up and I've read her book, so that's why I came along. Um, yeah, and I'm a walking artist. I'm working on quite a big um, project at the moment where I'm trying to, well, a very big project, walk all like um, the Ordnance Survey maps of the UK and take a picture for every kilometre. Brilliant. Thanks, Danny. That's great. Welcome. Um, Elspeth, Billy. I'm a fan of Sonia's. I've walked with Sonia um, a lot and um, love the book. And um, love Soundwalk September last year. Yes, that was fun. <laughs> So, um, yeah, lovely to be here. Lovely to see everybody. And um, well done, Sonia. OK, so Lara's next. Um, but, yeah, I'm an archaeologist and also a fan of Sonia. I've been walking on her um, distance drift since the beginning of lockdown. Um, and I walk for fun and I walk to get from A to B and I walk to think and I walk a lot for work. Um, and I've got a walk in Sam Walk September actually that I made for for um uh for my job called the Unseen Herd based in Ramsgate, um based around women's lives. It's Rebecca. Uh yeah, I'm a friend of Lara's and um I follow Sonia uh as well. I'm an archaeological researcher. Um my research primarily works with uh liminal spaces and uh especially uh, movement equating to transition. I use walking within my practice. Um, my, uh, my, most of my articles are um, 
based around wandering and pondering. Um, and uh, they are a mixture of um, my field practice is a mixture of psycho psychogeography um, and uh, unconscious meandering and so on. So I'm really excited to be here. I think it's going to be really interesting. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Rebecca. Fantastic. Uh, Sally? Okay, I'm Sally. Um, I'm an artist and this um, meeting resonated for me because I'm, I set up a project um, people walking at the same time in different places with um, a poetic prompt and we're doing it for 52 weeks of the year and we're up to week 39 at the moment. Um, and people send some kind of response, it could be a photograph, drawing or words, and then one of the walkers combines them all together, fuses them together into a, into a collage. So um, we'll have 52 collages eventually, which we're hoping to use then as prompts to kind of inspire other people to, to walk. So we just had a, an online meeting and there's a kind of enthusiasm for, you know, at the end of the 52 weeks that something else is going to is going to carry on and I think in spite of you know it's, it's been inspired by lockdown in a way but I think people value walking um, alone but in a sense together so I'm really interested to hear what other ideas are coming up um, and we have people in different parts of the world as well so we couldn't do that we couldn't physically walk together so we've got someone in India Kazakhstan um, in um, Turkey and Italy, so you know, it's kind of amazing connecting, you know, across cross borders. So yes, I'm excited to to hear. Brilliant! Yeah, thank you, Sally. That does sound incredible, isn't it? To have people so far away, far flung. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll go to Teresa. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm. So I I came across the distance drift um, over the last year and, and joined in. Um, I'm a researcher um, and I look at women and the landscape. Um, and I'm, I'm just about to start writing about pilgrimage. Um, I also use uh, walking as part of my academic sort of thinking process, creative process. Um, and I also walk with refugee tales regularly, which. Um, we also walk um, virtually together um, throughout the pandemic. So, um, so yes, it's lots of different ways of thinking and using walking. Um, I also use it for well-being um, to um, help self-regulate post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so, um, so yes, I, I really look at ways that um, the the landscape can sort of help rejuvenate and connect. Um, but I also look at very early historical texts. So I'm thinking about women trans historically as as well as sort of um, in terms of mobilities or lack of mobilities quite often. So, I... Wow. Uh, gosh, this is a very, um, uh, a very walked experience group, isn't it? This is fantastic. I'm, um, I describe myself as a walking sound artist. Um, I come to most of the walking cafes when I can and um, I was involved in a lot of the PRESPA activities, though not in PRESPA uh, this year. And I, I do a lot of walking by myself, so I'm just really interested in, um, in what Sonia has to say. Hello everyone, I'm Zoe. Um, um, I've, I've mostly always walked to help with my kind of creativity and anything else. But um, I normally do graphic design, but it, it kind of folds out into other areas. Um, I'm mostly interested in, you know, the, the concept of place and about the built environment. Um, but also, I take part in Sonia's distance drifts every Sunday, and I can see a lot of familiar faces here. We've never actually seen each other, a lot of us, in real life before, so it's really lovely to see everybody. Fantastic. That's really good. Sonia, you've really done something special here, so well done. Uh, this is Rosie from Penned, uh, just tuning in um, because I'd love to hear Tonya, Sonia speak more about walking. I could read Sonia's biography that she's written on the Walk, Listen, Create website, but I think I'll just ask Sonia to introduce herself. Well, thank you very much for um, coming along, everyone, and thanks to Andrew and Babak for inviting me. Um, yes, I'm Sonia Overall. I'm a walking writer, psychogeographer, um, somebody that just really likes to get out there and, and get my feet blistered. 
um, and be in the world. Uh, more on that. I've uh, been writing Walking Together for as long as I can remember, really. Writing has always been inspired by walking. Writing problems have always been solved by walking. I believe in walking as a creative process and it's not just for writing, it's for everything, as so many of you know, because this is what you do. Um, and my recent book, Heavy Time, which I will read from in a bit, um, is my experience of trying to marry my very intensive psychogeographical approach to walking small dis short distances with a full scale pilgrimage um, and actually putting in the mileage. So we might get to that. But what I wanted to talk about in this session was about isolation and togetherness, because I felt that there's a connection between my time when I was walking alone on my pilgrimage pre lockdown and my experience of walking hyper localized walking through lockdown um, with distance drift. Um, so some things that I want to throw out there um, when we're talking about walking alone, what does that really mean? We're always walking with others. We're walking with other people in the landscape. We're walking with the non human. We might be walking with the past. We might be encountering tangible and intangible heritage wherever we go. We're walking with memory or memory of our own walks, collective memory of of place. <laughs> um, we may be if we're taking a pilgrimage, attempting to walk with some more spiritual aspects as well of the unseen. I was very interested in thin places um, in my pilgrimage and also this concept of genius loci that there is something in it. There is a spirit of place that dwells in place and that can be encountered. So can we ever walk alone? Do we ever walk alone? I don't think we do. Um, there's a stage of pilgrimage, which is where the pilgrim becomes immersed in the landscape. And I'm interested in this concept of a kind of holistic, loose, boundary form of self, that the self merges with the landscape, that landscape and walker become somehow connected. And what does that what does that do to us as isolated individuals walking alone? Um, taking this pilgrimage really did teach me about the importance of human interactions and exchanges and how there is a genuine weight to these um, and take them for granted every day. And there's a short extract that I'd like to read from Heavy Time um, about the concept of Sonder. So I'm going to read that and then I'm going to throw some more stuff at you to think about. So I hope I'm not talking for too long, but this should keep us going for a while. Apologies for the seagulls on the roof. No. So this is um, this is for sort of mid, as you can see, kind of midway through Heavy Time um, when I've walked from Canterbury to Southwark. And I'm about to take the second stage of my, my journey from Southwark into East Anglia. Uh, so at this point, I've just, I'm just about to leave Southwark Cathedral to take the next stage. I have a final pee, another glass of water, and knit back to say farewell to Chaucer's window. His pilgrims are social as they travel the way, singing, storytelling, mocking and flirting. My walk has been very different. This lone extended interval of psychogeography has made my rare moments of interaction in a shop, on a footpath, in a cafe, feel rich and meaningful. I'm aware of an expansiveness and gratitude as I make my way down the nave and out into the sun. At this juncture in the journey, I can recall many small pleasant exchanges from the last few days that at any other time would be hurried and overlooked, forgotten. Lives bumping against each other in the swim of daily activity. Is this a state of grace? Am I passing into the next stage of pilgrimage? Or is this a moment of secular sonder? In his online dictionary of, of obscure sorrows, John Koenig describes sonder as the realization that each random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex as your own, populated with their own ambitions, friends, routines, worries, and inherited <coughs> craziness. An epic story that continues invisibly around you like an anthill, sprawling deep underground with elaborate passageways to thousands of other lives that you'll never know existed, in which you might appear only once as an extra sipping coffee in the background, as a blur of traffic passing on the highway, as a lighted window at dusk. Walking has brought renewed importance to my minor bumps and jostles with passers-by, 
the faces of strangers impressed, distinct in my memory. For months to come, I will be able to recall the features of people I meet on this walk, strangers that I speak a couple of words to, or who simply nod my way. It's as if the clay of experience is softened, moulded like dough, by the repeated actions of moving and looking, of listening and seeking, of walking, walking, walking. So I'd like to come back to this idea of sonder and see what people make of it. Um, so to distance drift, which is the sort of connection, <laughs> connecting element of, of a lot of the people that are here, but also of my most recent walking activities. Um, it's really, I feel distance drift has really brought together a community of walkers that would otherwise not have met. So if there's anyone here that doesn't know what distance drift is, it's a, it's a Sunday morning walk where we share, I share a, a walking score or a prompt and people can join in wherever they are. It runs via Twitter. Um, it came about um, as a result of a handful of people, I think, Lara, you were one of them, that uh, suggested walking with my um, drift deck because it was a group of walkers that, that regularly met up and walked together um, and wouldn't be able to do this. So maybe they could use Drift Deck. And I said, oh, well, I'll deal if you like. It'd be fun. Um, that was the first Sunday in April 2020. And we've been going ever since. Uh, needless to say, we stopped using the deck quite quickly and started using other things. So it's been a really extensive project. So it's really kind of gone much further than I expected. And um, as somebody else was saying about walking with people who are geographically dispersed, that's what we've been doing. We've had people dipping in and out from all over the world. There's a regular UK um, walking base as well. And that's really that dispersal has really been overcome by connecting online. So we're walking apart, but we're walking together. We're walking at the same time. We're looking for the same kinds of things in different places. Um, so I think there's a depth of connection to the environment and to others in lockdown through these activities. And there's also been kind of pastoral element, I would say, of us sometimes sharing experience of being isolated and walking alone. And that has encouraged a lot of empathy amongst walkers. So I've really noticed as we've kind of got to know each other, people have shared more personal feelings as well while they walk. Um, I'm going to say something now that might that might sound a bit out there and I'm, this is this is what we're here for isn't it it's to provoke i'd like to talk about being in the world and being one of many um i strongly believe that if we're attentive to our environment it makes us very present it makes us mindful of place we're, we're in the moment we're there and we are never alone in a place is can there be this this moment of revelation that that Sonder describes where we kind of recognise suddenly the individuality of, of, a, of another person and then think about how many how many of those individual lives there are that we might touch or glance against. Can we do that with place? Can we have that kind of revelation that discrete places that we invest in, these small pockets of land that we invest in in our immediate neighbourhoods, have their own ambience, have their own stories, have their own histories. And they are just small patches of this continuous whole. Is that something that we could aim for? And if we did, how would that make us treat the environment at large? So I'd like to suggest that localised walking and the immersion of, of extensive lone walking that one experiences in pilgrimage share this kind of invested attention to place. And I think those things can lead ideally to a kind of sense of stewardship of place and the environment and the natural world, um, but also of a kind of increased awareness of our contact with the non-human and how much we really need to pay attention to that now. So I'm not just saying when we walk alone together we're contact, making contact with other people. I'd like to suggest that we're actually making contact with the planet. So I'd love to hear what people have got to say to that. That's my provocation for you tonight. Yes, well, walking on your own, you become much more uh, aware of um, the, um, uh, the land around you the trees um uh i i go 
to the um, same part quite, and you begin to um, have a feeling about uh, the trees and um, the uh, you you actually feel as if um, there's a bit more ali aliveness coming out of the, than um, you um, initially uh, were aware of. So you're more aware of the um, space of the trees, the um, uh, rather than simply being uh, an image that you see. You become aware of, of more ab about it. Um, so, um, I mean, that's just my uh, when I'm walking along uh, fairly, fairly slowly. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, uh, do, do you feel that as well, Lee? That sort of. Um, something slightly um, more um, Im more than an image that you that um, ha you know you can feel the space of the tree yes and that's something very particular to walking I would say as well I mean so, we can cycle past the tree we could drive past the tree we could see the tree through the window but when we are in the same space as the tree we have a really physical, tangible relationship to it, and yes, to the space that it takes up, and to the yes. atmosphere that it creates. And the, and if we walk past it regularly, or walk around it yes. regularly, and pay attention to it, how it changes, just even minutely day by day, as well as through the seasons. So yes, absolutely. Well, could I add something to that, Claire? Would that be okay? Um, when you're saying about the, the trees um, and um, sort of our proximity to them or our connection or our viewing of them, um, it's brought to my mind um, particularly some of the older trees, um, for instance, the yew trees. Um, and quite often um, on pilgrimage, I've noticed that a lot of the yew trees um, situated in churchyards are actually older than the churches that are built there. Um, and um, certainly when I walk, I very much get a sense of time, not only um, from the early, um, I look at very early um, uh, historical texts, mostly written by women. Um, and um, I think that sort of feeling of sort of time folding in on itself, that sort of constant sort of temporal connection with those that have walked before us and are connected to the land in some ways, and particularly trees. I'm always looking up at the trees. So, um, yeah, that definitely resonated for me. Mm. But I'm conscious that there has been, particularly through the pandemic, a real um, push for walking as uh, walking for well-being. You know, walking as as a way of reconnecting and and improving mental health. And I I would say absolutely that's that's what this is doing as well. When we go for a walk, when we're on our own, when we take ourselves out of the bubble of home and if we can, and I appreciate that's been very difficult for a lot of people, um, but when we can go outside and even if it's just into a garden, even if it's just into a park, we're reminded, I think, of of our place in everything. Um, and that's, I find that immensely reassuring. Um, yeah. yeah, oh, sorry, go on. I was just thinking about what you said, Sonia, about landscape and that. I'm just starting a new project to do with World War One and pilgrimage and the fact that after the initial fanfare of putting up monuments and great eulogies, King George was persuaded that it was not up to the state to try and discover where people were buried or reveal great Icon, iconic things because it wasn't down to the state. This was about families who'd lost people. And he went up on a pilgrimage. And Rudyard Kipling wrote a poem called Pilgrimage. And 
it was about paying respect to people who had died and nobody knew where they had died or how they had died. And it was about connecting to the landscape and about using the concept of pilgrimage to connect the landscape and to connect to those who we'd lost. So I think that historically, and coming myself from, as you know, and the Andes, an Andean background, walking is part of history, you know, walking in the Andes and part of past cultures. It's recorded in those walks and in the walking. Um, and I think it gives us the opportunity to write and think about the world in a very different way. So I, th I think uh, your provocation is brilliant. I'd love to hear, thank you, Billy. I'd love to hear from some of the distance drifters, if you're willing to speak, about your experience doing distance drift and what, you know, whether it's, what's, what purpose it, it has served for you. I, I know it's, it can be a bit of a commitment if you come every week. A lot of people can, you know, come every week, other people dip in and out. But what's it? What's it done for you? I suppose I'm not asking for praise here. I'm I'm genuinely interested because we so rarely get the chance to. Kind of I say very quickly. It. I'll be very quick. Banter, Twitter yeah. banter. That it's is what it's been for me. Yeah, because Help yeah, it's, it's meaningful. It's deep. It's all these things. But banter and jollity has been um, a great part for me. Great. Thank you. I I do want it to be playful. Yeah, I think thank you for me. Oh, sorry. Go, go first, Lara. No, go, go no, no, you go. No, you. Okay. <laughs> We're all gonna go for it. Um, for me, it's, as I said before, you know, it's, it's do my creativity, but it's helped me to carve out a dedicated space to myself, to allow myself to explore my creativity further, but also within a group of people doing the same kind of thing, and you know, even though. The stuff that we produce, we're producing alone. We're kind of producing it together at the same time. We've got different experiences and reactions to different things, but with the same, you know, like the same theme, but the same kind of thing going throughout it. If that makes sense. <laughs> but that's that's I, you know just it's just perfect for me to just you know get my own sense of it's full well-being of creativity and time for me. Yeah, that's that's really lovely to hear. I mean, I very selfishly, well, I say very selfishly, but I don't think two weeks of my life is terribly selfish to walk away from things. Um, I know people do a lot more than that, but I did feel like I was being quite selfish when I took two weeks to to do my pilgrimage to just kind of step away from everything. Um, it was an enormous luxury and very hard earned to get that time. So I completely get what you mean about needing. If you're trying to do something creative, needing headspace, especially if you've got family and you've got work demands, to just say, bye, I'm going, I'm going, I'll be back in an hour. <laughs> so I'm glad it's worked like that for you. Could you say something about uh, your journey, you know, and, and uh, uh, the difficulties or otherwise of, um, of, uh, walking on your own from um, um, Canterbury to Southwark? Um, yeah, brief, I, yes. I have read the book. So I, 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 yeah. I can, I can say hear. something. Um, so, yes, walking on my own, I, I wasn't worried about it at all. Everyone around me was really worried. We had to, my family, I had sort of kept it from in-laws and didn't tell extended family what I was doing because they would have just nagged and worried and pestered. Um, so I, I did, I walked from Canterbury to Southwark and then my plan was to walk from Southwark to Ely um, via Waltham Abbey. Um, I grew up in Ely, my family was there. 
um, and then to move on from Ely to Little Walsingham, which was my ultimate destination. Um, I hadn't, so things that, problems I encountered, I hadn't prepared enough. I'd got a sense of the route and I knew where I was staying, but I am a writer and I'm a middle-aged writer that spends a lot of time sitting at a desk. Uh, and I really hadn't carved out enough time to prepare myself physically for the sheer stress of trying to cover up to 20 miles a day, day in, wow. day out. Bonkers. Um, you know, I could, I can do a 20 mile walk and I'm okay and a little bit achy the next day. Try doing that for two weeks. So there were problems there. Um, I also encountered kind of, you know, the sort of usual casual chauvinism that women on their own experience a couple of moments that, you know, felt a little bit risky, um, but I came home in one piece, so it's fine. Um, and it was a heat wave. <laughs> I was walking in July and it was a heat wave. Uh, that wasn't fun. Um, there were moments that were fun. There, there were moments that were extremely difficult, um, but I would do it tomorrow if I could. I would go again at the drop of a hat. I mean, it was just such a great experience. And to be able to say, I'm still, you know, just that moment of I'm stepping out on my own and I'll see you later. <laughs> it was such a liberation. So really worth it if you can do it. And if you can do it safely, you know, and if you feel confident about it, I'm a very, so I'm told, a very stubborn person. Um, and that probably helped. Did you feel um, uh, lonely at times? Uh, no. You're no, alone. no, and I think this is this is why I'm trying to say that actually I never feel alone when I'm walking, even when there isn't a soul to be seen. And I think that's that's part of the act of of walking is that it 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 kind of retreads places people have been. It it brings memories of people that you've walked with before, or that you know you see something and you think of the person that would be interested in it. it it's it's constantly entertaining and <laughs> as well as quite arduous um so no i didn't i didn't feel lonely at all and in fact i i did feel really as i said in the, in the section i read i felt at that point really connected to other people in a in a quite different way in a quite um yeah in a sort of in a totally different way almost a spiritual way and that sounds a bit crazy i mean i'm not I'm not a person of faith, so this yeah. pilgrimage was, was not about that. Um, but it was about trying to find something a bit deeper, and I, and I did feel that when I when I encountered other people that there was something very human and very yeah. um, precious about contact with other people. Uh, I'm yeah. quite interested. So part of the community. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Sonia, I was going to say, however, you, your your destination you chose, uh, and also you, you, you said you were going to go by Ely Cathedral, I think, and, and you then end up in Little Walsingham. I mean, you can't get more faith-orientated than that. I mean, Little Walsingham is a, a shrine to, uh, you know, Roman Catholic shrine. It's, um, you know, uh, how can I say, it's a sort of huge religious tourism destination. So you know, having been to these places, I mean, what, why did you choose those places? I know you mentioned Ely, but I mean, uh, why did you choose to walk to somewhere that is so related to faith and pilgrimage if you're not a faith person? And then maybe the other question is, have you become a faith person since? Do, did you feel so much from that place, which are either thin places or places of devotation, uh, devotion, were they did they have any reaction on you? Did they? Okay, so the reason why I chose Little Walsingham uh, was because I visited, so I grew up in, in Ely in the Fens in East Anglia. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a really lovely little city with a beautiful cathedral. It's, you know, it's a place that a lot of people come to. Um, as pilgrims as well as as sort of you know tourists of of attractive places um, my parents had always taken us out to interesting historical locations and they took us 
it took my brother and I, when I was in my early teens, to Little Walsingham. And I remembered very distinctly, and I can still remember it, and it was reinforced by going back. Having one of those moments, which I'm sort of talking about, a thin place, um, being a, a place where you can feel more than is visible, if you like. Um, I had a really strong experience of that place. I remember standing in the street near the old pump in one of the marketplaces. It's a tiny little place in Norfolk. And just really feeling the buzz of this place. It wasn't busy, you know, it was, it was a really quiet day, but feeling this kind of energy to the place and thinking that, you know, it's, I, I looked back at it and thought, is it the investment of all those pilgrims going there? Is it, is it the historical weight of the place kind of making itself felt? It was the, um, the shrine and the abbey there, obviously, you know, kind of part of a very savage persecution during the restoration, uh, sorry, the Reformation. So it, it was all knocked down, but because Walsingham was a shrine to, to Mary, um, it was very popular with women and it was particularly brutally taken apart as a shrine, um, you know, and a lot of unpleasant and very misogynistic things were written about. Um, Walsingham and people that went there. So, you know, there, there are all of these things that I know now about it that I didn't know then when I was probably 13 or 14 standing in the street, but I felt something and I really wanted to go back and find out if I'd feel it now. Um, and I suppose I went back to it knowing so much more about it and taking all of that knowledge with me um, to experience in the place. But uh, yeah, I did. I, I felt I, you know, I didn't feel the hand of God, I haven't been converted, but I do feel very positive that there is something about collective memory in place that we can tap into. I think that's the thing. I, still, I kind of always felt that I, I would describe myself as a, as a bit of an animist, really, and somebody that, that believes in landscape holding the past. Um, and I definitely believe that now. So kind of reaffirmed my my slightly yeah, <laughs> my slightly psychogeographical faith, if you like. Places remember events, as James Joyce wrote. Yes. <laughs> yes I, I agree so. with you. I, I feel that too. Those layers are so interesting here. Yeah. I think it's about um without getting too gloomy about stuff, it's about death. When you're in the landscape and you walk and you're aware of the earth and the smell of the earth and the rain, and you do know that's where you will end up. That's where we all end up, even if you're cremated. And that is our connection. I look at the earth as many, many layers of skin of people. And when you walk it, you are reminded of those layers. It doesn't matter if you're religious or not. It's an interesting way of looking at it. It's sort of like the landscape has, has many bodies, yes, or as a body with many layers, yeah. I think I see it, but particularly when I when I was going back to the fens, I you know I have a very um aesthetic relationship with the fens now where i see all of that love so the fens are sort of reclaimed land from from uh, the washes um it's really dark soil it's black soil it's kind of freakly um i find it stunning now i just love to look at it and that that kind of aesthetic glory <laughs> if you like of walking and seeing all of this soil oh it's just it's it's so good for the soul i think but i don't see it and think death i think i i know what you mean though billy i kind of i see life you know i see generations and generations and generations of life and and deep past of that yeah. not it's a recycling far. isn't it yeah, it's that, yeah it's a cycle that it's you know it it continuously gets transformed yeah. And I, I'm interested at the moment in our demographic here, 
because it's yes. mostly women apart from our two hosts who are uh, <laughs> and I think interestingly because of um, all sorts of things I think women are much more prepared to have these conversations for some reason um, talking quite openly about life and death um, not, maybe it's yeah. because of giving birth I don't know well, I was, going to pitch in, I was going to pitch in and ask those people who are distance drifters, especially after Billy having said there was a, uh, you know, a lot of uh, jollity and banter. Um, how is this experience of being here in this cafe um, different from being uh, on a distance drift? So what I'm looking for there is how important is the element of walking or the action of walking rather than sitting here? having an opportunity of having a conversation uh, with people who are remote is there you know is there is there a huge you know is the walking the element that makes it so much stronger than a natural conversation i'd just be interested i think it, it is i think it's the, the i mean it's it's great to be sitting here in a virtual cafe with distance drifters who i've never seen some of before but i think it, there is something about distance drift that you know you're all moving through a landscape even if it's your house landscape or it's a park landscape but you're all moving at the same time through this kind of a moving through time and space element that really makes it feel possibly more connected than just sitting in front of a computer talking um I guess, I guess it's just sort of three dimensional, you know, just the sort of, I suppose, I don't know, embodied experience of moving while being with each other, while not being with each other. <laughs> yeah, do, do, also do, relationships, do. relationships have formed. We didn't all start off with the banter. Mm. It, it's because over time we've got to know each other. We know that Julie is going to run around photographing everything in sight and come up with this constant stream of consciousness, which is Julie's way, which is great, you know? And then, you know, we've all got our own little input, but that is, we, 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 there's a sort of, under, yeah, it's relationships, it's friendships, without actually having met each other. And in fact, probably seen each other for the first time, really, <laughs> on screens. But uh, yeah, I think there is a bond in there. Yeah, I mean, I'm also kind of intrigued with the distance drift is whether you fall into step. I do you find that you're moving through the landscape at a similar pace, that you are, even though you're distanced. It's so, Zoe always comes in about six hours later, don't you, Zoe? Is Zoe here? Yeah, Zoe's here. Yeah, Zoe, um, Zoe no, always no, not always quite that long. <laughs> <laughs> Probably about maybe 15, 20 minutes later. Um, and it's really difficult to, what I don't do is look at what everybody else is doing as if that would just inform everything that I do <laughs> after that. So I just try as much as I can. I, I really love looking at what everybody's doing at the, as we go along because that's part of that group experience. But at the same time, I'm very concerned that it will inform what I'm going to create next. So that's, that's the tricky one. So, you know, I try as, as much as I can to get there on time. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's, that's what it is. It's, it's just doing that same thing. Pardon? It's much appreciated that you're, you're kind of extricating yourself from the children and trying to get out. No, no, no. I love it. No, it's, it's my time. <laughs> it's lovely. Yeah. yeah. I think it is, it's interesting, this, the, this idea that we might start doing similar things because we, one week, um, we, we played a game of Snap because I really wanted to see how similar what we came up with was. Um, and there were a lot of snaps, weren't there, actually? <laughs> quite, a lot of, quite a lot of similar things. Um, but people could do, do distance drift in different ways. So there are people that join asynchronously. There are people that are regulars that don't um, interact with posts until the end, which I think is, is probably quite sensible. I can't, I'm terrible. I peak all the time. I can't. Mm -hmm. not see what everyone's doing and then I've always missed something as well because it especially if it's a, a particularly busy week I would just spend <clears> an hour going around like this with my phone like answering everybody so I kind of try and do a bit of both 
Um, but there's, it, yeah, we've come, we we walk for about an hour, and then it, it, my usual ritual now is, at some point between eleven and twelve, I'll go through the thread and look what everyone's been doing and comment on it, and it, it's just delightful to see what everyone's been looking at, thinking about, experiencing where they've been in the world as well. You know, very different types of environments. A lot of people still joining in from home, which is great because we get to, I'm nosy, I'm a writer, you know, I get to have a peer at what people have got <laughs> like that. Um, so it's, yeah, it's been, it's been an absolute joy having so many people joining in and, and sharing their experiences. But there are more of you here. I'd really like to hear from you if you're game for saying something. This is the first time I've heard about distant drift. I haven't, I, I haven't known anything about it before. Do are you interacting um, on any particular, um, like Twitter or uh, something, or 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 are you using up or um, and um, yeah, yes. I, just like a bit more explanation about yes. how, how so you go about it. It's on Twitter. It's on Twitter and it's yes. every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. I share a prompt, a walking prompt or score for people to, to join in with. And then people yes. use the hashtag distance drift so that they can see each other's responses. Um, and sometimes I'll oh, post right. one thing yes. for the whole hour and sometimes I will tweet prompts you know through the hour to change things up depending on what we're doing yeah. is that uk time yes so people are not people around the world are not doing it at the same time necessarily then uh that not necessarily be... we have had we've have had really? some wow. we, had a, we had a very intrepid uh <laughs> distance drifter in canada who was getting up at crazy o'clock to join in with us um, yeah yeah yeah, we've we've had people in Europe, you know, the timing's not that different. Um, a couple of times we had somebody in, in India that, that found us and joined in, which was lovely. But from home, I don't know what sort of time of day that was. Um, but yes, you can do it asynchronously as well. You look like you're somewhere warm and sunny, Vivian. I'm in not. New York. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> so I'd have to get up at five to join you, yeah, yeah. which probably is a bit beyond me, actually. <laughs> You'd be welcome to, to do the walk later and, and share oh. because, yeah, people do. I mean, some people do it the next day. Yeah, there are lots of, of late walkers that, well, they're not late. They're just doing it when they want to do it. And that's absolutely fine. I, I wanted to say that very quickly. Sonia puts up the prompts. So if you go to Sonia's feed, you'll have prompts one, two or three or maybe just one. And you can actually follow it in your own time. And I think um, sparing Sonia's blushes, I think the prompts are key because it's the prompts that um, are often synchronized with fes festivals. Uh, so Sonia is um, a great lover of folklore. So um, that's integrated into the prompts. And um, the thing about liminal space is that one of the most amazing distance drift things that happened to me with Sonia was when she suggested we walk with a hand mirror or a mirror and I picked up my grandmother's mirror and I couldn't leave the house because we were in lockdown and I went inside the house and it really took me back to my grandmother's life because she never went anywhere uh, she was she lived in Argentina she once came to visit me in the UK and she sat in a flat knitting doing exactly what she did in Argentina, because that's what women of that time did. And it took me to that place. And I think that's um, an experience I'll never forget. So um, yes, I totally recommend it. Yes, I'd, actually, I'd like to ask a bit about the prompts. Uh, and I'm very intrigued, um, Sonia, by the mention of the deck of cards, because I, I lead sound walks and I often give out little cards to people which have a sort of rather enigmatic prompt for listening. And I would just be really interested in hearing about, uh, you know, what kind of prompts and what was on the deck of cards. <laughs> OK, so hello, Bavak's cat. It's, I'm glad it's Bavak today, not my oh. cat. I've had to barricade myself in, otherwise he'd be here as well. <laughs> 
Um, yes, I, I haven't got a pack handy, actually, but um, I created a, a deck of um, cards for walking that, that just sort of randomise ways of walking, find, you know, find a portal to look through, turn, take the next, you know, the second left, um, look up, turn 360 degrees, that kind of thing on the cards. So they're very directive, which is why we use them a little bit at the start. but. We would just end up, you know, taking walks in circles. And because we were um, we were in the very first lockdown when we did this, it wasn't possible to go any distance. And some of them require you to walk to a landmark, for example. And so they're, they're great fun to take for a sort of walking game over some distance if you've got plenty of time. Um, but the, the walking prompts, the walking scores that I do for distance drift, yes, they are often seasonal. Um, I'm quite keen on and tapping into seasonal things, but they can also be really frivolous. Um, I, I am capable of being quite silly with them. Um, oh, recently, it was, <laughs> I don't know if anyone remembers the Punch and Judy walk, but that was um, mentioned in the <laughs> in the write up in the, the Scottish newspaper that where the, the, um, the journalist interviewed me as part of a kind of discussion of, of walking through lockdown and she was obviously very tickled by the punch and judy walk because that's the one that she mentioned um i seem to remember the hitchcock walk went down quite well um that was that was a popular one so it's you know you can take just take the title of a film or of a kind of evocative piece of music or something and and see what you find that matches that or sets up the narrative if you like. I'm very keen on narrative walks um, because that's something that I do a lot, taking texts for walks and I do that with my students as well. Um, so finding the stories of place, finding the hidden stories of place, what, what's really going on here, what could be going on here, how can we how can we misread or reread or reimagine this place or scenario or sign or um, series of objects. Um, I think one of my favourites was the monster walk, actually, because I love doing monster walks. I've done a few of those, try and find evidence of the monstrous in your environment. Um, yeah, so lots of different types of things. And if you would like to try any of them, um, Vivian, you, if you do look at, if you're on Twitter, if you look at the hashtag distance drift, I'm afraid there's loads of stuff there now. <laughs> um, but you would be able to go through the thread and see some of the, the prompts. We've done some sound ones. Um, um, we've, we, you know, I, I like to do tactile ones, but in a pandemic, I can't, you know, ask people to go around touching surfaces and picking things up. So that's not something we've been able to explore. Um, but working with the seasons, yes, working with, um, working with the elements as well. Thank you. Sounds wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so I think Distance Drift has been really great as well for sort of reminders of the festivals and the sort of changing seasons. And I mean, I haven't been able to join quite so much as I'd like to lately, but but when um, when you've done one, um, Sonia, of festivals that I kind of are buried deep in my memory from possibly even from school, but haven't really recognised since. And um, that's been really fun, sort of rediscovering folklore and being in the landscape while we're discovering it. I think. Yeah, well, we've got one coming up because we've got we've got the 1st of August. So we will be doing I don't want to say too much, but we will be doing um, a seasonal walk this Sunday. Yeah. So one can uh, uh, put in a hashtag for distance drift. Distance drift. See yeah. what comes up. Yeah. Yes. And what one can add to. Yes. And if you tune in at, if you find Sonia, Sonia's feed at 10 a.m. on a Sunday, that's where the new hashtags will be coming out, I guess. Right. Um, I'd just like to add, if that's OK, I don't actually get, I didn't get outside to do a lot of the distance drifts last year because I was in solitary lockdown for a very long time. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to take part in many of them this year for various reasons. But what Sonia has helped formulate through the distance drift and reading the threads, I read them throughout the week with people who are um, 
drift in um, at their times. Um, I found them really inspiring for my own work. I am a folklorist and I really love seeing how people engage with their landscapes and um, hearing Sonia now say that uh, she considers herself an animist is just music to my ears. Um, so um, I think I know that technically it could be termed a project, but for myself, it's something much, much more. And um, I think that especially now that we're in this COVID um, situation, this, this time period that's probably going to be ongoing for some time, connectivity really is key. And, you know, this together but alone. And the fact that um, you might not all be walking at the, the same time, but as Lara said, you are together, whether you're walking on a Sunday morning, you know, British time or three days later, whatever, because you're all part of that experience. Although, although your experience is unique, you are all part of that experience. And for me, that is something that's really, really important. Thanks, Rebecca. It's been it's been lovely to see people that aren't necessarily doing the walk occasionally just chime in with a response as well. There's been quite a few of those, and that's really lovely because it's it, we're sort of storytelling, aren't we? Really, as we go along when we do these walks, we're we're sharing Absolutely. ideas, we're creating our own strange walking narratives, and yes, they're all part of of one big story of of our walk each week. Exactly, and we're and you know through your wanderings, wherever you wander within your home, we're locally further afield, um, wherever your pilgrimage is, take, you are adding to the story of the land, whether you are conscious of that or not, you, you are becoming, you know, part of the stratigraphy. And for me that, and as I'm very much with you on this, Sonia, for me walking, I walk, with those that have come before and those who haven't yet manifested they're there we just don't see them so i for me walking i see as life you know um and walking as release so um yeah and it is storytelling um whether or not you write that down physically or you keep those stories in your head the times where you know you're not having a good time you need to regress in order to progress and stuff. I, th I think it's really important. And I love the book as well. <laughs> uh, can I chip in something else, which is not about distance drift, actually, something I I'd be interested about what people think um, is, um, when when you go on a pilgrimage or on a kind of dare I say it sort of durational walk, but where where maybe you walk you know two or three days in a row, you you, you uh, for myself you know you sort of kind of fall into a uh, yeah a contemplative mood I suppose, but what I find is that people approach me and. Uh, uh, and I've heard this when I've spoken to other people who do long, long walks and things. It's almost as though the walker takes on some kind of aura, if I dare say, using that word. But they, they take on some kind of aura, and that they become approachable. Does that make sense? Um, I, I wonder whether that's something that Sonia, you, because you, you talked about the fact that you were. Um, you you were uh, being a, you had small uh, inter, you know little exchanges and that you kind of remember them. But do you think those exchanges you know wouldn't have happened if you'd you know just you know parked the car around the corner and popped out to walk the dog or whatever the you know kind of thing? Do, do you think there were that exchanges took place because you know perhaps you, you appeared unusual or? You know, you're carrying a pack or whatever. I mean, I don't know, but or, or is there something genuine that after we've walked a period of time in a landscape or through a landscape, that we we take something on 
un unknowingly, which then makes us of more interest to passers-by, or well, we are the passers-by, aren't we? I mean, I don't know. I, I'm just interested to explore that a little bit. That's interesting. I don't know. I mean, as as Billy pointed out earlier, we're all women here. Um, I think women's experience of walking in public spaces can be very different. Um, and so to be approached is not always a good thing. It's not always a positive thing. To be noticed is not always a positive thing. But yeah, I certainly had some some very um, pleasant exchanges with curious people. Um, so when it depends where you are, I think. When I was walking early stages, you know, on footpaths and um, country roads, cyclists were very friendly. Cyclists seemed to like to see me out with a pack. Um, I got lots of cheery waves from, you know, middle-aged men in Lycra, which was kind of cheering, you know, it's that sort of... Yeah. Mike looks confused, you've not heard that expression, by the way. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, there's, uh, yeah, so there was a lot of that, that kind of you speeding you on your way. When I stopped for my first pub stop, which I write about, um, on the first leg to Faversham, the people in the pub were really curious you know it was a really bloody hot day and there i was with sort of you know dripping with this big pack um they were really interested and they were really friendly and they wanted to wish me well so i think when i got to certain places and it was clear that i'd walked there people wanted to know what i was up to um whether i'd taken anything on other than a layer of grime and you know and sore feet i really don't know um I'd like to think so, but I, I just don't know. And I, I think it's probably also about how we look when we walk. So I, this is another thing about being a woman when you walk. Try not to draw attention to yourself. You sort of, you don't, you don't catch people's eye unless, you know, you're feeling particularly comfortable about where you are. Perhaps, I don't know if this is the same for everyone, but that's certainly been my experience of trying to stay relatively safe. Um, when you're on, when you're clearly on your own as well, when you're clearly on your own for a long time, you do have to be really careful about the sort of attention that you draw to yourself. Um, yeah. But yeah, I did have some some really pleasant exchanges and some not so. If I can um, say, I, I've I um, I tend to walk quite extended periods. Um, I walked for 18 months on my own in Europe and, and when we're not in lockdown I go off for weeks at a time on my own but um, I'm, I'm pretty basic, I don't even take a tent, I just take a bivvy and just go for it but I, as Sonia said, I tend to keep very much on the peripheries, I, I don't want to be, because as you said it's nerve-wracking uh, as a woman <clears throat> being out especially in some of the landscapes that I tend to frequent but I was quite interested um, with what Andrew said about this aura do we collect an aura I, I don't know how I would describe it I think that the, the spaces we walk within the places where they they connect on to us they <laughs> remain with us and they're there permanently and I think that um, the experiences that we have when we're walking in those and the fact that they're then within us forever people pick up on that after the event even and when they um, then people once they know that or once they pick up on that then that entices people to ask and then they want to hear your stories and then from them they they develop ideas and stories in their head some maybe some want to go out and walk themselves or they just like listening to your tales and 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 things so um i don't know if that sort of is going along the lines you were thinking of andrew but um yeah and and i and i think that the stuff i write about and people are like oh my gosh you know you you go and spend nights in forests on your own that's terrifying but we love reading about it <laughs> so it's always like i'm i'm doing it for them in a way it's scary i'm not i'm doing it for me <laughs> but you know for people who wouldn't feel comfortable 
going to spend nights on end in a forest they can kind of read my strange ponderings and in a way be there too if that makes sense <laughs> Yes, it's a good vicarious experience, isn't it, when we, when we read about what other people do. Yeah, yeah. And like, so in a way, I was on your, I've, I've experienced your pilgrimage in a, in a wee way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, I, I absolutely wholeheartedly feel for you because I'm fully aware of the kind of chauvinism that goes on and I'm, um, but what also also is a very big positive for women walking uh, is the fact that you can approach people and uh, you can approach people and become involved in incredibly intimate situations which we men could not possibly do so Billy at one point mentioned um, having children or whatever but I mean there's absolutely no way that a man can you know ap approach um, situations where um women can go so there are sort of different places that women can explore or different experiences that women can explore while walking which men can't do um and for me one of the areas which really uh kind of infuriates me now is that i can't go anywhere near a children's playground because i'm a seen as a dirty old man even though i'm not a dirty old man <laughs> i you know i i've I've had that when I worked professionally. I was a, I worked for the National Children's Bureau and I worked for the Children's Play Council. And I was a technical advisor for the government on how to reach children and uh, outdoor play. And I was assessing playgrounds. And yet I was not able to go to those playgrounds without being in the company of a woman. So, you know, I kind of, I fully see what you're saying and don't I'm not going around saying it doesn't happen because I know full well by talking to hundreds of women that definitely is the case that men are not helpful towards women and in fact sometimes downright aggressive um but there is this kind of strange thing now that we're kind of in a in a situation where we're, I don't know whether when when we talk about the pandemic and and you hear politicians, they say, oh, you know, quickly get back to normal. Well, I don't, there are lots of aspects of normal pre-pandemic that I don't actually want to see come back. Um, and one of them would be uh, the abuse that women face when they go out for a walk. I mean, I'd hate to think that returns to the level it was, because um, just before the pandemic, you had, you know, Me Too, you know, that, that was like riding extraordinarily high. So. Yeah, there were lots of things pre-pandemic which I, which were just treat were taken as normal, which I wouldn't want to see return. Anyway, uh, uh, we we you know we've got about another. Well, the, the deal with a cafe is it goes on until you all want to stop talking. So you know, please, there are some of you who are listening in who haven't spoken, um, and others who have only spoken a little bit. So you know, if you'd like to say or ask or pop an opinion or just passing remark please do it's your turn uh your opportunity well feel free to put something in the chat if you if you don't have a mic that's working for some reason i just asked about the distance drifts are they um has it evolved over time what you and is it what you kind of did you have a vision of what it would be and then it's become something else yeah it's it's been a complete surprise <laughs> it really was going to be just a very small scale let's do this and see what happens and then oh that was fun should we do it again next week and then oh should we keep going for a bit yeah let's keep going through the first lockdown oh it hasn't really ended let's keep going a bit longer Oh, it still hasn't really ended. <laughs> um, oh, it's been a year because I thought when well, it's been a year, maybe we'll, everyone will have had more than enough. But we're still going. Um, and I think it is because it's it has turned into something quite different. It's. Yeah, as Billy was saying earlier, it's it's now kind of friends that know each other through distance drift, turning up for each other, I think, as much as anything else. Um, and it's for me, um, it's been. 
I mean, it's been many things, but it's also been, as Zoe was saying, my time. You know, I that's my stamp on the calendar every week. Um, my family knows that I'm going to be doing that. <laughs> it's nice to say, no, sorry, I've got to do that. People are waiting, you know, I've, I've got to go. Sorry. Hi, you can do the washing up. Yeah, that kind of thing. <laughs> it's, been, it's been really good for my sanity as well to have those regular markers. So when everything in the during the sort of worst bits of lockdown, I say worst, there aren't any great bits really, but um, when things felt very fraught, um, days were just, for me, were just merging. You know, I had no sense of time. I had no sense of how long ago something had happened. But I knew that on a Sunday morning I'd be doing that and I'd had to think about something that we would do. And that, that was, that's that been really helpful, I think. It's really helped me sort of have, have an understanding of the passing of time over the last 18 months. When there haven't been many markers, you know, we haven't had the usual activities and events that that set out the seasons and the weeks. It has gone quiet now, hasn't it? <laughs> Everyone's thinking about wine and tea and <laughs> yeah. Actually, um, Andrew, um, I just wanted to pick up on, um, if I may, um, you were saying about this this aura that you felt um, sort of with, with pilgrimage, um, and I'm, I'm not sure that I, I sort of felt it like that. But actually, um, certainly when I was walking the um, on the Camino a couple of years ago. Um, I sort of felt that um, meeting other pilgrims, um, it, it was almost like you sort of bypass the usual um, when you first get to know someone and that sort of, you know, the pleasantries. It was almost like everyone completely bypassed that and went to something much more deeper and meaningful. Um, and therefore, there was sort of a much stronger connection immediately, which I hadn't experienced anywhere else um, doing anything else. Um, and that really struck me. And, and certainly the people that I met on that pilgrimage, I started meeting and uh, walking with just one other person. And we walked into Santiago with about 11 of us, um, 11, 12 of us. And, um, you know, we've regularly met up online since then. And I, I talk, you know, having only walked with those people for a matter of weeks, I, I can immediately go into conversations that I wouldn't have with people that I might meet much more regularly in my hometown. But there was this, I don't know, just something else something else so um so yes it um yeah it just it just struck me what you were saying about that um and, and certainly picking up on your point about the you know the difference in the places where men and women can go and the different places that are open or safe um that's something that i very much think about and um yeah that's um a really good point um Actually, um, if, if I may just pick up on one other thing that Rebecca was saying when um, people are reading your work and you're sort of going into these spaces that obviously, um, you know, it's, it's, it sounds quite, um, you know, it's sort of quite a journey um, and um, for other people to sort of read it and experience it vicariously. Um, and, uh, and, you know, for a long period of time, I, I, I'd, I'd really like to read your work, actually. Um, I, I mean, I, are you on, how would I access your work? Um, um, so um, I have a website um, that's uh, the address is uh, liminalworlds.org. Um, and on there, uh, it's so it's basically the umbrella site for my four ongoing projects, which are yeah. very quickly. <laughs> Um, underpasses, liminal places, dialects of the hum, okay. future ghosts, okay. we are all ghosts in the making, and paranoid okay. architecture, Palladian mm -hmm. concepts within Neolithic contexts. And so oh, this website, okay. it's, um, it's, there's no rhyme or reason that it's, it's quite psychogeographical in the way it's set up. Although we have the different sections, it's, people literally can just dive in and lose themselves. And there's my writings are generally under the wandering sections, ponderings and wanderings. We cover I cover all manner of things. There's also short audio pieces. We have a podcast, the Liminal Lounge, with various different people. And again, we um, we just drift through conversation. It's, there's no structure to it. We just literally see, 
we have no idea where these things are going to go. So, um, yes, and um, hopefully we're just waiting on confirmation. Um, I, uh, um, I'm hoping to be beginning work on a book uh, on the liminal worlds and a book on the hum next year. Oh. And, uh, um, then we'll be starting the fundraising for the field work. Um, we're, uh, yeah, I'm planning to go wandering for minimum six months, maybe 18. Depends on uh, uh, how much uh, money I can raise. And how much the publishers are willing to give me up front. So. <laughs> good luck. Good luck with the funding. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank Thanks you. For the yeah. 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 Oh, God. Is that a, oh, sorry. Tonya, have you spotted that Danny's written something in the chat for you? Yes. I wasn't sure if that was. Um, for me or for for Rebecca, but maybe we could. I, I don't know if it's for you or for me. I, you go for it. <laughs> um, so with the pilgrimage, I had to I had to research where I was going, obviously, because um, I only had a limited amount of time to get there, and I needed to find places to stop. Um, so I researched the route to some extent, and I was also trying to match existing pilgrimage routes as far as possible. But um, I, as I say in the book, I think there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, potential disputes we had about any British routes that are genuine from, apart from the A2, <laughs> from, from <laughs> Canterbury to Southwark. Um, how much do I, so yeah, do I approach the landscape with an open mind and let it reveal itself? Yes, I think I do. I think that's like a geographical aspect. When you're doing a, an extended walk, you do need to do research about route, but you can obviously, mm. um, as uh, as a butterfly, as I am, not stick to the route um, and digress and go and look at stuff that's tantalising and <laughs> yeah, think, what is that down there? I want to go and have a look. So so my route was constantly interrupted by my psychogeographer's butterfly eyes that wanted to go and check something out. Um, I did quite a lot of research afterwards as well, so I would be curious about something. I'd make a note. I'd then look it up and try and find out more about it. But there were there were key places I did know stuff about, and I had done a lot of research about Walsingham um, before I decided to do the walk because I was still so curious about it as a place. So a combination of those things, I would say. Um, and and you were saying there that you usually walk and research after, and I think that's I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that because when you go to a place with a set of expectations, you're you're already you know you're already closing down perhaps to some extent some of the things that might occur to you. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I also think that if you you know you're on a mission, if you're you're taking like when we distanced if you you're sort of taking <coughs> a lens through which to look, then that's fine. You know that take that with you. Um, but, but I think if you're if you're just following your curiosity and letting the landscape speak to you, then then that's great too. Rebecca's nodding. Do you feel the same? Yeah, I mean, um, I think um, when I decide if I, where I'm going to go, whether it's a, a short walk of a couple of days or, or a longer walk, like Sonia. Um, well, with the shorter walks, I the only thing I really plan is uh, so, like I went out to Rendlesham Forest um, a couple of months ago now, I think. So the only thing I'd actually planned, because I knew I only had a couple of days, was um, the public transport from London to Woodbridge. And then the minute I got at Woodbridge, um, I knew the general direction of the forest. I and then I would just went and. Um, uh, and yes, I obviously know the popular culture connotations of Rendlesham, and it's quite interesting because lots of people thought I was going there to have an alien experience, which actually couldn't have been further from the truth. Um, I think they were really disappointed that I didn't have, or well, not that I'm aware of, that I had <laughs> an alien experience. Um, for myself personally, when I'm out, I have to give myself over completely to the landscape. I, ca I can't, I, I, one of the, my sort of mantras is feel, not think. I think when I get home, 
and I I use my the camera on my phone because um, it's it's really a regular occurrence that I get so caught up in what is going on. I I don't even I'm not aware of my actions. I'm not actually even aware of where I'm walking. I'm just enveloped in all the senses around me. And like Sonia, I will just duck and dive and um, what's that film up with the wee dog and squirrel? It's like, oh, squirrel, and I'm off. And I, the, when I get back, I then look at my phone and, I, and that's when the real fun begins because I will then have photographs that I have no real recollection of having taken, but I look at them and it's like, wow. And where Sonia writes in her notebook, I have um, an, an, a voice recording app on my phone. And then I listen back and it's quite often I can't even remember making those recordings, but I listen to them and it's like, wow, that's quite interesting. And then when I look at, put it all together, so it's nice because the memories I have on the journey home, I have this one set of memories, which I guess are the conscious memories. But then once I sit down and I open up the phone and, and start looking, this whole other journey opens up in front of me. And it's that's really exciting as well. Um, and I'm not saying everyone should do that, you know, um, it, it works for me. I, I guess that's the landscape punk in me, you know, the, the stum and lang and go for it. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it yeah, it, it it works for me, like so. <laughs> but yeah, not not everyone should do that. If they're not cool with that. <laughs> so. um, a big thank you uh, to Sonia. A big thank you to pinned in the margins um, for publishing Sonia's work because I've really enjoyed the book and uh, everyone who hasn't bought a copy, you've got to go rush out and buy a copy, heavy time. We haven't actually asked Sonia what, why she chose that title. A big thank you, Sonia, and you have the last word. Thank you very much. I'd like to say thanks to everyone for coming. Thanks to everyone who distance drifts along and hope to see you again soon. Thank you for those, to those of you who've um, bought the book, which is great. Um, I know it's lovely to hear when people have and what they make of it. The first weekend of September is the Fourth World Congress of Psychogeography. Brabac's going to be playing walking roulette with us, I understand, which I'm looking forward to seeing how that works. Um, so have a look for the Fourth World Congress of Psychogeography. I'm going to release the programme properly this week, so that's quite exciting and hope lots of you can come. So there's there's going to be lots going on. It is online again this year, which um, in a way is sad, but also means that people all around the world will be able to join in again, which is fantastic. So that's my final plug. Thank you very much for having me along. <laughs>